Now I will introduce Jonathan Cross, who is Professor of Musicology at the University of Oxford. Hello, Jonathan. Um, so uh, Jonathan is a professor here. He's also chercheur associé in the Analyse des Pratiques Musicales team at IRCAM in Paris. His published work on Stravinsky includes The Stravinsky Legacy from 1998, the Cambridge Companion to Stravinsky from 2003, and a biography of Igor Stravinsky from 2015. He has written, spoken, and broadcast widely on a range of issues concerned with modernism in music, from Debussy to Bertwistle. His current work is concerned with musical spectralism, including a forthcoming book project on Tristan Murai and nature. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Gassia. Very good to see you. Um, it's very nice to know that so many um, old friends are out there. It's just a shame that we can't see and hear each other. <laughs> but there we go. Thanks also to Lola for the invitation and to the whole team for setting up this, this uh, wonderful event from which I've already learnt, uh, learnt a great deal. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great session. Um, my uh, talk, I suppose, uh, adopts a slightly different tone. It takes a rather different approach. I guess some might say that's symptomatic of the uh, age gap between me and so many of the great younger scholars we've heard so far today. But nonetheless, it, it intersects, I hope, in, um, in constructive ways with these ideas of urban space and nostalgia that we've just been hearing about in the last uh, two papers. And I'm looking at, uh, if you like, um, new uh, architectural spaces in Paris in the 20th century and the relationship of one particular creative individual with those spaces. Uh, the idea of uh, urban nostalgia, if you like, as a lens through which to, to, to read uh, the concerns of that music. So as we've already heard, uh, even today the urban environment of Paris is essentially defined by the changes that took place in the 19th century. Until the middle of that century, the city's layout had changed little since medieval times, and as Jack told us earlier, one of the first grand projects undertaken by Napoleon III following his self-proclamation as emperor in 1852 was to commission the reconstruction of Paris from the prefect of the Seine, Baron Georges Eugène Ostermann. Ostensibly designed to rid Paris of its overcrowded slums, to put it crudely and to enable the installation of a new water supply and sewers, the project was surely as much motivated by the desire to push out the working classes from the centre in order to build a capital that expressed the aristocratic glory of the Second Empire. And at the heart of the newly redesigned city stood what is still one of Paris's most glorious buildings, the opera. It was Napoleon III's pet project and by far his most expensive. Work began in 1862 to the design of Charles Garnier, but it did not finally open until 1875, by which time the Second Empire had come to an end and the emperor had already died. Standing at uh, 56 metres from the street level to the apex of the, uh, of the fly tower, Garnier's opera was taller on its completion than most other buildings on the Rive Droite, with the exception of the Louvre. And just as the neo-Roman triumphal arch formed the focal point of the city's axe historique in celebration of Napoleon Bonaparte's military victory at Austerlitz, so the Opéra would stand in honour of Paris's cultural might in its commanding position at the conjunction of some of Osman's finest avenues. The building's neo-baroque exterior with sculptures in praise of art and industry, along with its sumptuous interior, as we see here, would come to represent in part at least the relative stability and optimism of the Third Republic, its golden opulence and expression of the confidence of the Belle Epoque, of Paris as the cosmopolitan capital of pleasure. It was made to impress. So when Igor Stravinsky made his first visit to Paris in 1910, it was to the Palais Garnier that he was heading. Thanks to Sergei Diaghilev, who'd commissioned his music, Stravinsky travelled to the city for the premiere on the 25th of June of his first ballet, The Firebird. 
given at the opera by the Ballet Russe Company. Diaghilev had already visited Paris many times since 1900, cultivating a Parisian thirst for Russian art. In 1909, he presented the spectacular first saison russe of opera and ballet at the Théâtre du Châtelet, another vast Second Empire theatre on the banks of the Seine, commissioned by Osman and completed in 1862. Back in the opera in 1910, Stravinsky's Firebird music was now centre stage. This fairy tale for grown-ups, as Benoit called it, this mysterium of Russia for export to the West, was tailor-made to appeal to Paris tastes. Stravinsky's music demonstrating not just an exquisite sense of musical drama, but also a complete mastery of everything he'd learnt from his teacher Rimsky-Korsakov. It all sent the public wild. Diaghilev had judged the mood of Paris perfectly, and Stravinsky responded appropriately. With hindsight, however, it's clear that Firebird marked a spectacular, colourful culmination to the 19th century, the end of a golden age, with its glorious designs by Baxt and Golovin, choreography by Fokin, and dancing from Karsavina. It was fitting, then, perhaps, that it was presented at the opera, but Paris was already changing. It was modernizing rapidly. The first metro line had opened in 1900 and the network expanded quickly so that by 1910, there were six lines in operation, inevitably altering not only individuals' perceptions of urban space, but also their attitudes towards modernity. Guimard's elaborate Art Nouveau station entrances, we see one example here, were made from industrial cast iron not stone or brick. Electric streetlights, first in fact installed on the Avenue de l'Opéra, uh, and telephones have both made their appearance in Paris in 1878 to coincide with that year's Exposition Universelle. And by the time of the Firebird premiere, horse-drawn buses were disappearing from the streets in favour of motorised transport. The first public screening of films by the Lumiere brothers took place in Paris in 1895, and the first cinema opened the following year. And then, of course, there was Eiffel's structure, made for the 1889 Exposition Universelle from wrought iron, towering 300 metres over Paris as an expression of the city's modernity. Tellingly, it was the conservative Garnier, along with Gounod, Massenet, and other artists who led protests against the tower. In these contexts then, the Parisian desire to see and hear exotic Russian folklore might well be understood, in part at least, as representing a nostalgia for an age that was fast disappearing. Stravinsky's next ballet, Petrushka, premiered just a year later in 1911 at the Châtelet, and it marked an extraordinary stylistic shift. The discontinuous structure of its opening tableau, variously described as cinematic, cubist, even by Adorno as grotesque, and its montage of an eclectic range of found melodies seemed uncannily to tap into a sense of a fragmenting present and an anxious, uncertain future. And at just the same time, a new building was under construction on Avenue Montaigne in the 8th arrondissement, a theatre embodying modernity with a framework made of reinforced concrete, fully electric lifts for moving stage equipment, and an ambition to mount a new kind of varied artistic programme of theatre, opera, ballet and concerts. The Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, designed by Auguste Perret, opened on the 31st of March 1913 and was illuminated on its first night, its opening night, by the spotlight at the, uh, at the top of the Eiffel Tower. And it asserted its modernist credentials by housing in its first months the latest works by, among others, Faure, Debussy and Stravinsky. It was broadly greeted with excitement by high society Paris. The most beautiful, the most modern, the most comfortable comfortable of theatres, writes Jean-David Jumeau Lafont. Others, however, denounced its modern neo-Greek-German style, its architectural nudity, 
as more in keeping with Munich or Dresden than Paris. The building's facade, as you can see, is simple, austere, unemotional, monumental and elegant. As uh, Christophe Laurent writes, it made a distinctive break with the dominant taste for ornamentation, revealing to the general public the innovative technique of stripping away, déprimant. Its modernism springs in part from the severity of its clear geometrical lines, an abstract reworking, if you like, of the columns of an ancient temple. Above the entrance doors and at the top of the frontage are bas-relief sculptures by Antoine Bourdelle. The large frieze, we can see it here, is a triptych entitled Apollon et sa Méditation that represents in stripped back semi-abstract form, the god Apollo surrounded by the muses, who are in fact multiple versions of the innovative contemporary American dancer Isadora Duncan, whose work in turn had been inspired by the representation of women on Greek vases and who became one of Bordel's muses. Duncan and Vaslav Nijinsky in the guise of Greek deities here also appear above the entrance to the comedy theatre in a bordel bas relief depicting the idea of dance. So this modernist reading of antique subject matter was to become characteristic of the aesthetic concerns of the post-war age, what came to be known as the Art Deco style, whose purity and, simpl and simplicity rejected the immediate decadent past and looked back further nostalgically to antiquity, as well as pointing to a modern future. And one might even interpret this exterior of the Théâtre Champs-Élysées as the reimagining and repurposing of Garnier's opera for a new age. At the highest point of the opera, we can see here on the roof stands Aimé Millet's bronze sculpture of Apollon, la poésie et la musique, clearly modelled on the antique Apollo Belvedere, which you can see there on the right. Similarly, at the uppermost central point of the Théâtre Champs-Élysées stands Bordel's very different Apollo, shorn of decoration, his muscular naked body, hinting at both the power of a new industrial age and the eroticism of a new era of sexual freedom. And of course, it's striking that Stravinsky's ultra-modern ballet, The Rite of Spring, was premiered in that very theatre on the 29th of May 1913 with its mechanical rhythms and erotic sacrificial dance, which interestingly was received by a handful of contemporary critics as being latently neoclassical. Jacques Rivière wrote of its clarity, simplicity, precision, the elimination of all superfluous and gratuitous elements, while uh, Vyacheslav Karatygin noted a gravitation towards classical clarity and elegance. It's almost as if these critics sensed in the Rite of Spring not only correspondences with the building in which it was premiered, but also facets of Stravinsky's work that he was yet to realize for himself. With the outbreak of war, all development stopped. And the Paris to which Stravinsky returned after the war was a changed place physically and emotionally. Many thousands of dwellings had been destroyed and Paris embarked on an enormous building programme of social housing. Equally integral to the story is the changed social atmosphere in the city. The terrible losses of French youth resulted in a kind of post-war collective forgetting, a frenzied party culture, tinged nonetheless with a, a sense of melancholy, a period later nicknamed Les années folles, the crazy years in which demobbed young men and newly liberated young women, Gertrude Stein's Génération Perdue, lived, worked, played, and consumed at high speed. And new buildings appeared in the resolutely modern style that came to be known as the Art Deco style to serve and shape this modern life. Metro stations, such as here, Vano. Uh, in 1923, stores, the first extension to Samaritaine in 1928, cinemas and entertainment venues such as the Folie Bergère, which opened in 1926, even bridges, Landowski's reinforced concrete Saint-Geneviève of 1928 on the uh, Pont de la Tournelle, uh, 
Stravinsky's first brand new work for Paris after the war, based on 18th century musical sources, might at first glance have seemed a regression from the new. Yet Porcinella, premiered on the 15th of May, 1928, uh, 1920, at the opera by the Ballet Russe, with scenario and choreography by Nassim and designs by Picasso, was an uproarious success with public and critics alike. Or many of them anyway. <laughs> In an interview published on the day of the premiere, Stravinsky himself claimed that it represented a new kind of music, and the vast majority of critics heard in it a modernism appropriate to the changed post-war world, a shift in priorities towards a new simplicity. It was comic, youthful, eclectic, playful, and ironic, and with its sleek melodies and energetic rhythms, it was every bit as chic, as the clean athletic lines of the fashions now being worn by the bright young people about town. So Stravinsky both participated in and defined a new Parisian musical style which resonated across the interwar years. Furthermore, in its presentation of a modernized classical music that looked both backwards and forwards simultaneously, Pulcinella was absolutely in tune with the emergent Art Deco aesthetic. Stravinsky's subsequent works pursued this tendency relentlessly. In his short essay, Some Ideas About My Octuor of 1924, he set out what amounted to a new anti-romantic aesthetic manifesto. He wrote of the importance of matters of form, counterpoint, and the exclusion of expressive nuances. Jean Cocteau captured the broader spirit of the age in his famous 1926 Rappel à l'Ordre, call to order, where art was to be autonomous, art for art's sake, elevating the classical to the highest level. And this also meant, of course, the literal reinterpretation of classical antiquity, already evident in, among, in among other examples, Bordel's sculptures for the Théâtre Champs-Élysées, and later one of the defining features of Art Deco architecture. And it was thanks to Cocteau that Stravinsky finally embraced the ancient world by leading him towards and then writing the text for Oedipus Rex of 1926-27. The monumentality of the achievements of Art Deco architecture finds its counterpart in this work, evident even in its monumental opening chorus, Cadit Nos Pestis. As Art Deco buildings borrowed from antiquity, stripped to their essential details in order to build a new world, so Oedipus Rex takes a Greek myth, as narrated by the ancient author Sophocles, and retells the tragedy for the anxious post-war age. This stripping back, one might say, represents a kind of expression of loss, a nostalgic yearning for a former simplicity. It should hardly be surprising then that Stravinsky next looked to Apollo. Classical order and purity are the defining features of Apollon Misagette, achieved by creating a thoroughly French work that, in Stravinsky's own words, espouses a melodism free of Russian folklore. And in order to represent the god of poetry, music, and knowledge, Stravinsky chose to write music for strings alone, infused with the rhythms of classical French poetry and French Baroque dances. It is a purely diatonic music purged of excessive chromaticism, a veritable ballet blanc, as he described it, a term derived from classical 19th century ballet. The scenario is stripped of any meaningful narrative, becoming a meditation on classical themes, figures, and dances. It might even have been subtitled Apollon et sa Méditation, recording, uh, recalling Bordel. George Ballantyne's sculptural, beautiful choreography was similarly restrained, pared back, where music and dance were unified in the expression of pure classical beauty, as we see here. That this production was entirely in keeping with contemporary fashion and Art Deco style is evident if one looks at, for example, the beautiful drawings made by Eileen Mayo of Serge Liffard dancing Apollo. A Greek pose, simple lines, clarity, lack of decoration, art deco lettering, and a Chanel style tunic. And while the original production designs were by André Beauchamp, 
Chanel herself redesigned the costumes in 1929. So we see here a Hellenic deity being transformed into 1920s Paris chic. On the 18th of October 1927, with the composition of Apollon Misagette nearing completion, Stravinsky conducted his own Firebird suite at the inaugural concert of the new Salle de l'Air. This building, sadly now out of use, is one of the finest achievements of 1920s Art Deco Paris. Its monumental unadorned facade in limestone has tall windows separated by stylized columns, but with smaller porthole-like octagonal windows at the top that betray the influence of the so-called style paquebot, the art deco style of the ocean-going liner. The entrance foyer is all white with elegant round columns punctuating the space and a central geometric floor mosaic in black and white. It is in all but name a modern temple to Apollo. Stravinsky played and conducted in the Salle de Elle many times in the remaining decades of his career, though he never actually liked the building. There is nonetheless a striking kinship between the new formal modernism of Stravinsky's music, exemplified by Apollo, and the elegant modern environment of Paris in and around which Stravinsky moved, typified by such buildings as the Salle de Elle. So in reconfiguring the classical past, for a new age, the simple lines and stripped back forms of Stravinsky's Art Deco music is a poignant expression of the urban spirit of 1920s Paris. But also, as evinced by the closing apotheosis of Apollon Musagette, where the so called Olympian theme is transformed into something deeply melancholic, Stravinsky's modern, playful, forward looking classicism also carries with it the sounds of loss and nostalgia that infused Parisian culture of the 1920s. Thank you very much. And back to you, Gessia. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I thought this was um, such a wonderful reframing, let's say, of Stravinsky's music in connection to Art Deco aesthetics, also kind of cultural attitudes and politics. It's 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 a really um, for me it's a kind of revelation about his music that I just you know hadn't really encountered. Um, I'm wondering. I mean, for, it's interesting to think about. I guess the shift from what's happening with let's say the Rite of Spring in the Tête de Champs Elysees to then the more overtly let's say neoclassical uh, forms and uh, references. And um, I guess I wondered, what do you make of the kind of primitivism, you know, that other kind of, you know, ultra modernist aesthetic, which is, you know, based on folk musics and this kind of, you know, extreme abstraction, let's say, um, that you also find in modern art, visual art at the time. And then this, um, you know, and uh, references to antiquity and the much more kind of classical, uh, elegant and stripped back um, uh, aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, thank you. Um, that's a very big question. <laughs> uh, hinted at it, I mean, what, what is so fascinating about, you know, pre-war work like, like the Rite of Spring is precisely this, you know, it's um, rituals of pagan Russia in inverted commas, it's subtitle, that's, that's looking way back and yet it, it's it's sound world it's 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 mechanical rhythms and so on are very much of the present of the of the industrial age and i think for me what is so fascinating about the reception of that piece is uh how different figures have taken different aspects of it but i notice uh there's a question from john that's come in as well that actually relates very nicely to to what you've just asked uh, Gassier about the idea of looking forward and, and, and looking backwards and whether it's accurate to say two different styles were starting to be created in Paris historically informed uh, if I understand the question correctly because yes we can we, we, we certainly see this kind of new desire for order simplification uh, in these so-called neoclassical works after the war but this was a process that was already taking place this in the you get this this kind of conflict in the in the Swiss years between, on the one hand, uh, uh, stripping back a very very simple kind of music, and at the same time, it, his it, it, in exile for the first time in, in in Switzerland, his most Russian music was also being being written. If one thinks of 
the soldier's tale and particularly uh, uh, Lenos. But actually, I think in response to John's question, it, it goes back still further. And if one thinks uh, of a work like Petrushka, which I mentioned, that in a sense, the very figure, the puppet M M Petrushka is a kind of uh, almost a sort of uh, figure of uh, a figure of nostalgia. He's he's uh, um, he is kind of alienated from the environment around him, not just in terms of the scenario, but indeed even in terms of the musical uh, construction. So that kind of fragment fragmentation that one finds in the opening opening um, tableau is absolutely symptomatic of that. After all, this was a tradition that no longer existed. It didn't really exist even for Stravinsky. So although it, it's sort of representing a kind, it's representing a kind of historic present, it was already a nostalgia if, and I think it, one aspect of Stravinsky's nostalgia is, is precisely this, a sort of imaginary Russia, a looking back, a, a, a creation of a Russia that, that never existed, or that certainly for him only existed in the imagination. So that was there early, and this becomes more and more exaggerated uh, as one moves through the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s in his, in his music. If I may, Jonathan, I think you were um, implying or, or said that, you know, this was also kind of uh, packaged and commodified for the Parisian, you know, public, that, that particular form of nostalgia, let's say. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think, I mean, it, 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 I often describe uh, least, let's see. The, as a kind of opportunist, uh, in the sense that you know his antennae to the world around around him were were very very finely tuned. Um, in the same way that one might say about you know a figure like uh, Picasso. I mean the, the, the parallels there are very interesting. I mean constantly changing and adapting. Uh, you know, Stravinsky was constantly re reinventing himself. Partly because I mean if you you know if you read his correspondence, you see he was obsessed with money more than anything else. <laughs> uh, and he was sort of giving the audiences, in a sense, uh, what they wanted, but in a, in a, very, in a very particular way. And he, he succeeded. Um, so Mark Pudinger, uh has an interesting question about Art Deco. Can it be ar argued that Art Deco is not entirely monolithic, but trolling in cliché, parody, satire and irony? Is it not these rewritings of the past in sound and image, a modern take on the past that critiques nostalgia itself? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting, a really interesting point. Um, with many of these things, I mean, Art Deco is such a kind of monolithic label, and I'm I've only here been talking about very particular architectural exteriors. Essentially, Art Deco was much more. Um, complicated than that and I think you know the name itself comes from the the, the 1925 uh, exposition in, in in Paris and and we often forget that of course it was presenting the 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 decorative and industrial arts the two things went uh, side by side and so actually I think the point that marking that mark is making there is a, is a really very important one you know that there was a sense through that nostalgia of a of a, of, a, of a critique, but also as I was trying to hint hint at, you know, a way of of trying to to cope with a, a you know, a, in a sense, a pace of pace of change uh, that was suddenly accelerating. Um, that, that's why a work like Firebird uh, is so fascinating. I mean, we think of it as a Russian work, but the, the, the you know, the, the idea that 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 the Agalev was was making something, bringing ideas together that were absolutely tailor-made for, for what the, the, Paris, the Paris audience was, was, was demanding. And that pace of change is also, I guess, reflected in the pace of change in urbanization and industrialization as well at the time. So there's um, kind of parallel there. Um, Claire asked, um, so how do you relate Stravinsky pre -war, Stravinsky's pre-war work to something like Strauss's La Légende de Joseph, premiered by the Belarus in 1914 at the Opera? Yeah, <laughs> another big question. I mean, I suppose for me, uh, you know, I'm using uh, this idea of nostalgia or the, uh, uh, as a lens in a rather different way from the way that, 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 that others we've heard uh, this afternoon. And for me, um, I find it a very uh, interesting idea within coming to an understanding of, uh, you know, the complexity of modernisms in um, early 20th century uh, European cultures. 
um, so that nostalgia carries with it perhaps you know these these ideas of 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 loss um, of you know uh, yearning for uh, a lost imaginary homeland um, anxiety alienation some of these themes which were clearly being played out uh, uh, before the war uh, as well as after the war so i mean actually strauss is here uh, um, claire knows better than me uh, uh, a really interesting figure in that regard and even if one thinks of a work like um, Rosencavalier you can see those those issues being writ large uh, in a work like that you know 18th century um, uh, subject matter uh, with a kind of essentially 19th century musical language but played very much uh, to a uh, 20th century uh, 20th century sensibility yeah Thank you. Um, a wonderful question by Lola, um, host Lola. Uh, she, she writes, Boim describes Eastern Europeans as having bad timing, often being described as both backwards and futuristic. Would you say that the Parisian exoticist reception of Stravinsky was nostalgic of a primitivism lost in centralized France? That's a really interesting question. I'm not really sure I'm qualified to uh... Uh, to answer it, or rather, I need to give it a, a lot more thought than uh, this this moment uh, allows. It is, um, you know, my my thinking on on uh, nostalgia, you know, owes a huge amount to to Boehm's work, and I think um, uh, rather than answering Lola's uh, question about France there specifically, I think rather it's this this simultaneous uh, that she's picking up with this simultaneous, you know, backward looking and forward-looking aspect of it that fascinates me. And we see this in Apollo, in Stravinsky's uh, Apollo very clearly. I mean, there are a number of nostalgias, uh, you know, at work there. We have, how might we call it, a kind of aspirational nostalgia. Like uh, Retrofuturism or something like, I mean, maybe that's a bit different, but. Um, looking forward, you know, moving forward by looking past. I mean, Stravinsky was reinventing himself in a sense he was kind of, kind of, uh, stripping away his his overt Russianness in order to um, you know adopt a kind of more Western European identity and and the classical heritage allowed him to do that. But at the same time, at the end of that work, as I hinted in this extraordinary apotheosis, something very very different happens. This is this is the other nostalgia or another nostalgia I should say of loss of yearning to return and indeed to return to a Russia. It's that hidden Russia that suddenly. Uh, emerges and the music takes on a very different character. It's no longer forward moving, but sort of gets stuck in a much more kind of circular time at the end that, that can't can't uh, can't resolve itself. Yeah. So interesting. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I think we're uh, perfect perfectly timed uh, for yeah. And uh, just a huge huge thanks for this paper. We have you know many uh, very positive comments in the chat bubble for your paper as well as for all our panelists today. So thank you so much. Uh, it was fascinating and indeed incre incredibly well presented. So 